Creo que ya está compartido. Um, This meeting is being recorded. Entonces, este año, um, en, um, en vista del Año Internacional de, de Fitosanidad, um, creo que tengo problemas. Ah, ya, ya está moviéndose. Eh, hemos organizado el evento en... Um, eh, mundialmente coordinado um, en sesiones eh, donde saltamos de diferentes eh, regiones del mundo. El primer día teníamos el, el Incepción, eh, donde teníamos presentaciones de la gente del FAO, del um, IPPC y del uh, Crop Trust, um, que es um, representante de los um, bancos de germoplasma del CGR. Ayer tuvimos el Día de, de Asia y hoy uh, tenemos el Día de América Latina. Uh, mañana va a ser el Día de África y el último día vamos a tener un, un plenario donde vamos a discutir las los conclusiones y, y uh, retos que estamos uh, enfrentando mundialmente uh, en ese uh, aspecto. Solo para darles un poco de, de introducción, ¿por qué estamos organizando eso? Um, los, um, los bancos de germoplasma del CGR uh, mundialmente están um, uh, distribuyendo um, el mayor parte del germoplasma eh, eh, que cualquier otro, entre todos los uh, bancos de germoplasma, um, alrededor del 85%. Y la mayoría de esas uh, distribuciones Está un poco lento, Ay, así. Eh, Jan, eh, sí. Jan, disculpa que te interrumpa. Eh, tenemos un problema con la traducción, entonces, eh, pues si pudiéramos esper esperar unos minutos para que le den acceso a Marianelli y nos okay. confirme que ella puede hacerlo. Ok. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. We seem to have a, a problem with the translation, so um, we're going to wait a few minutes until they confirm that uh, translation is working. Perhaps in the meantime, I could continue in English. Maybe most people do understand English. Um, so I think I'll do that so that we don't lose time. Um, so in, in this slide, I, I just wanted to point out that most of the germplasm distribution that, that is happening from the, from the CGR gene banks is going to um, uh, countries that are uh, in development. Uh, another about 80-85% um, of those and therefore we have a particular responsibility to make sure that we're uh, distributing clean material and not introducing pests and diseases with the material that we're distributing. And most of these materials in fact again about 80% go to national programs or NGOs uh, in the countries uh, where these uh, materials are transferred to. Um, And that's a very good thing because this germplasm that we transfer uh, enables the, the development of better um, uh, crops um, and cultivars, um, improving the, uh, the yield and agriculture worldwide, but it also implies a, a certain risk if it's done, not done responsibly. And these risks are, of course, uh, the introduction of new pests and diseases, and, and here there's a couple of them that are, that are relevant for um, Uh, this region, uh, we have the case of uh, zebra chip and the potato psyllid that has entered into Ecuador and it's, it's now spreading quickly. Uh, we have Halong Bing that um, ha entered uh, several years ago and has spread also very quickly. We have uh, tropical race 4 of uh, um, Fusari moxisporum that has entered into um, Latin America recently. And this is a case where something went the other way around. So it came from Latin America and entered into Africa and quickly spread throughout the continent, causing a lot of devastation and then moving further into Asia as well. So we need to prevent that these kind of things happen through the, the movement of our germplasm. And therefore, um, the CGR centers uh, that have gene banks have um, uh, 
developed or have a, a germplasm health unit that is independent of these gene banks and they do all the health testing uh, of the materials uh, under the most stringent um, conditions to ensure that um, no pathogens are inadvertently moved with uh, germplasm material. And amongst that, it's not just pathogen testing. Um, the germplasm health units are involved in regulatory compliance. Uh, they uh, uh, support uh, surveillance and best risk assessments. Uh, we do training and capacity development. Hacemos desarrollo de capacidades y capacitación y uh, vemos los patógenos de nuestros cultivos y nos ocupamos también de distribución, así como del desarrollo de eh, nuevos uh, procedimientos uh, avanzados. Y es así que hoy en día tenemos a varias personas que van a hablarnos sobre los distintos uh, procedimientos. That, uh, that the base of the uh, uh, germplasm health units of the, the three CGIR centers that are um, present in Latin America. So we have Dr. Maritza Cuervo, uh, who is the head of the germplasm health unit at CIAT in Colombia. And uh, we have Amos, uh, Amos Alacoña, who is uh, head of the seed health unit at CIMAT in Mexico. Uh, Joanna Miller, who is managing this health and quarantine unit at uh, CIP in Lima, Peru. Uh, and then we have a guest, Israel Espinosa from Senacica in Mexico, who will also present uh, today. And then Dr. Jorge Jorge Andrada will um, talk a little bit about a case of um, uh, a potato purple top and how um, uh, uh, a regional um, action group is trying to uh, control the spread of this uh, disease within Latin America. And we have with us today, I think, uh, representatives of the, uh, the national uh, plant protection uh, agents of, of the, of the um, countries that are hosting these uh, CGR germplasm uh, banks uh, from uh, ICA, Senasica, of course, who is, who is presenting and, and Senasa also here today. And we look forward to having their input in discussions as well. So um, with that, maybe I will um, finish this introduction and hand over the um, um, presentation to Maritza Cuervo um, to present um, her talk on uh, the phytosanitary measures for safe distribution of maize. Oh no, this is in the wrong order, I see. Okay, so Amos will be presenting first. Uh, phytosanitary measures for safe distribution of maize and wheat germplasm uh, from CIMIT to the world. And so I will stop sharing my screen. Um, stop sharing. And can I confirm that um, the translation is working already? Amos, if you can hear me, you can take control the, of the screen and start your presentation. Is Amos with us? Hello, hello, John. Ah, hello. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Amos. I have access to share. So, can I have access, please? Uh, yes, uh, um, I'm, I suppose our, the meeting organizers can hear this. La reunión pueden escuchar esto. Por favor, le pueden dar acceso. Le pueden dar acceso a Amos. And it looks like the translation is working. Parece ser que la traducción está funcionando. Eso está bien. Have you tried? Yes, the icon is not showing up. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, so maybe 
if it doesn't show up soon, I can start preparing to share it for you because I think I have a copy of your presentation. And yeah, then you sure. just have to let me know to, uh, <laughs> to, to move to the next. That's, that's yeah. Let, let me just look for it. All right, um, I'm gonna share my screen for you. Um, da, da, da. Um, can you see it? Not yet. Yeah, wait, I still want that. Okay, we can see it now. Okay. So Amos, just go ahead and let me know when I have to change screen. Okay. So I'm going to present about uh, phytosanitary measures for safe distribution of maize and wheat, which are the main the mandate crops for CIMIT from CIMIT uh, offices, uh, the, the regional uh, centers to the world. So my name is Amos Alakonya and um, I am the head of seed health unit at CIMIT. Uh, Next, please. Next, please. So as an introduction, uh, CIMIT, uh, the seed, um, oh, something is changing, right? Sorry, well, uh, I went too far. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, CIMIT, is one, uh, CIMIT hosts one of the biggest maize and wheat dumplers in banks and also breeding program for the two crops in the world. And uh, we have 13 offices spread out in Asia, um, in all the five continents, and also, uh, and, 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 and also we collaborate with so many national partners, mostly in developing countries. So basically, CIMIT distributes like half a million envelopes of 100 gram seed for test experimental testing and uh, also just distribution for many pu other purposes in over 100 countries worldwide. Next, please. And uh, this seed, the 500, uh, half a million envelopes amount to about 10 tons of wheat seed and three tons of uh, maize seed. And some, in some of the countries, we have duplication of uh, collaborators who are about 300 in total worldwide. So since most of these collaborators uh, are from developing countries with limited phytosanitary infrastructure, CIMIT ensures that the seed distributed is free from pests and pathogens. And uh, as a, an internal policy for CIMIT, even if the, because some of these countries where we send seed have limited capacity as an internal policy within CIMIT, even if the country has not listed the pathogen as quarantine or regulated, we do not uh, distribute disease that has any pathogen or because of their limitations of where we work. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, so this is just to show you a map. This is just to show you a map of different places where we, so you can see other than Iceland, we send seed to almost everywhere in the world. And the red dots show where we send seed, wheat seed, and the blue show where we send uh, maize seed. Next, please. Next, please. So at CIMIT also, we want to, we, we strive to comply with both international and international guidelines in, in terms of uh, distribution of seed. And internationally, we comply with IPPC guidelines and nationally we comply with SACAPA uh, and SANASICA guidelines to make sure that we are working 
within the guidelines of the country where the headquarter is located. Furthermore, if we are sending seed to any other country, we, we look at the import permit and make sure that we comply with those country, country guidelines. In addition, the CGIR under the GenePunk uh, platform where the GHUs are, are best, we have guidelines that we should not distribute any seed that is infected with pests and diseases. And uh, as I said earlier, at, at, uh, at CIMIT as a center, we have a policy of zero distribution of any seed that has, is infected with pests and diseases. Next, please. Now, what is the role of seed health unit, which is the GHU at CIMIT? First of all, our goal is to ensure that we exchange the exchange of seed by CIMIT, whether incoming or outgoing, is free from inherent risk of spreading plant pests and diseases. How do we do this? We do this through a very robust phytosanitary system involving of stringent seed testing and also inspection. So, next please. So how do we do it at uh, CIMIT? Generally, this shows that, so at CIMIT, um, we, we put all the burden in terms of sending seed or receiving seed on the seed health unit and the seed distribution units, which work together. And what happens is that as a CIMIT scientist or any person in need of seed from CIMIT, you, you conduct the CIMIT scientist or the, jam, uh, the, the gene bank, and then after that, after you, you agree on what you want to be sent or received, the whole burden comes back to seed health unit and seed distribution unit, which works with the national authorities, Sanasika, to issue the permits, to do the inspections, and we, to coordinate with customs to get the seed released. But when the seed is released, it is sent straight to the seed health unit, which will then test it, and if found to be free from um, any pathogens, will then be released to seed distribution unit, and we then work together with the with the with the Sanasika to do the inspections and then send the seed to whatever partner who has requested or to allow it into our breeding programs. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, so seed health unit um, is approved by Mexican phytosanitary authorities, and also since uh, April two thousand and seven, it is uh, ISO certified. And in addition to that, we we follow all the guidelines in Mexico, and uh, this gives a lot of confidence to our collaborators and also in the country where we work. Other than that, we also collaborate with other certified laboratories where we exchange blinded samples to make sure that, and compare results to make sure that whatever tests we are doing are, uh, are credible. So we look at what we send a blinded sample to say Sanasika and we also test it here and check that the results are the same. So, what do we do at seed health summit? So we have interest both on what is transmitted inside the seed and what is on the seed, because all of them have potential risk, phytosanitary risk. So we check for fungi, viruses, bacteria, and in cases where we want to do endomology tests, we, we submit our samples to a, a third party, uh, uh, other laboratories which are certified in that area. Next, please. Next, please. So this is just to show the different work areas. We have the sampling phase. We have the uh, visual inspection phase. We have the microscopic uh, phase. And we, we also check for germination and look at the seedlings germinating in the skin house to make sure that if there are any symptoms that we miss during laboratory testing, we can also see them during active growth. Next, please. So, 
So for a long time, uh, the, the, the system we use has been manual, but with a collaboration with the International Potato Center, we are introducing a, a PILIMS, which is a phytosanitary uh, with a pathology laboratory information system to automate and link up to our breeding programs and our data management system to make sure that uh, uh, it's easy to capture information and uh, make these requests. So we have we we are eighty percent uh, done with this system, and uh, but the ultimate goal. Next, please. The the so. Our, our ultimate goal is that to have all the breeding management softwares and all the gene bank request softwares like Green Global, EBS, B4R, to be able, you can make your request, generate your lists and have the same uh, identifiers with, with our phytosanitary laboratory management system. And also during your requests for for jamplasm, you can. We our ultimate goal is that you can be able to check on that uh, in the system and be able to see if the material you are requesting has already been tested and uh, found to be clean. Because sometimes we get requests and the jamplasm that is being requested is not clean and we cannot distribute it. So this system will. There will be some crosstalk, and we expect that uh, this will make it easier in terms of our generating reports and communicating with other systems. Next, please. Next, please. Okay, you can skip with that one. Next. Next, please. Okay, so I would, I, I, I would like to present to you uh, two situations, how we ensure that our uh, um, wheat breeding program is is generating clean material, and in and in that focus, I will talk about the phytosanitary guidelines we have to prevent the spread of candlebunt, which is a very regulated disease, both in Europe, uh, Africa, US. So if we if our material has this disease, it means that we are not able to. Um, exchange it. So in uh, in CIMIT uh, wheat program, we have both the summer breeding and wheat breeding cycle. Unfortunately, uh, at the at the at the winter breeding cycle, we have the location has is listed as uh, having canal band, which is regulated. So if we don't put in place guidelines to prevent this uh, the con the spread of canal bark, it means all our wheat material will be contaminated. Next, please. So what we do, next. Jan, next, please. So what we do is that uh, we have pest-free, uh, canal bark free areas in Mexico. So when you see the red, it indicates that it, the canal band is present there. And that's where we do, it. around that region is where we do our winter cycle. And we, we have Batan down here in green, and we have Mexicali up there. Next slide, please. No, you're moving very fast. So anyway, so what happens is that uh, we're, during our winter cycle, we go up here, to do our breeding in Obregon. So what happens is that the breeding will happen there. We have very stringent movement of this in, onto the station, a lot of signing in. But after the cycle, we, we during the cycle, we will we'll apply chemicals. And when they harvest the seed here, we will, we will clean it, inspect it, and any material that is found to be having kernel burn symptoms will be discarded. Then we wash the seed and stringently take it to Batan, which is down here, where then we plant it in specifically allocated plots. And that's where we do our summer breeding cycle. But these plots that we have here in Batan are, um, are labeled plot M, which are specifically for multiplying seed, which means pre and 
Here we do a lot of inspection to make sure that the disease did not escape and come down here, which is a pest-free region. And then we inspect the seed, make sure it's clean, wash it again, and then take it back here, which is called Mexicali, and it is free from any, uh, is free from canal band where we multiply our seed. So what happens is that the seed from Obregon cannot be distributed internationally until when we, we grow it in Batan and take it to uh, Mexicali, which is a pest-free region, to make sure that it is, it's free from any pathogens. That's only when we can distribute it. So we have infrastructure at both locations for inspection, cleaning the seed, and getting all the certificate. So this is the type of the infrastructure we have for cleaning the seed and uh, inspection. Next, please. And we, we have certified warehouses where this seed is checked and stored and to make sure that we don't spread these pathogens. Next. So the current, now currently we have a, a wheat blast, which is now showing up in Africa, in Asia, and we, we have seed going both directions to uh, between uh, Mexico and other, offi uh, other offices. So because of these threats with our uh, regional, with other countries in Asia, and now Zambia has the disease, we don't allow our centers that are in these regions to directly send seed. Like for example, we, can, we don't allow Bangladesh, Bolivia, or uh, India to send seed directly to Kenya where we have a testing facility for uh, rust. We, all this seed comes to headquarters to make sure that uh, where we have a very good capacity for testing. And uh, after we confirm that the seed is not uh, contaminated, that's when we send it. The same thing, we have UG99 in Africa, Middle East and, and in Asia. So we don't allow the exchange, direct exchange of this seed. All this seed has to come through Mexico to make where we check and make sure that it's free and clean it and then treat it well before we can allow it to be distributed to the other regions. Next, please. Another thing is that uh, since 2011, we have had a uh, uh, an outbreak of maize lethal necrosis in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, our, we have the biggest maize breeding program in sub-Saharan Africa. <coughs> so what happens is that we had to put in place mechanisms to control the, the spread of maize chloretic motor virus, which is the cause because the, the other potivirus, uh, the, the, the sugarcane mosaic, virus, which is mostly attributed with this disease, has been in Africa for long. So what we did is, uh, next please. We, we seed health units supported the maize breeding program in East Africa to develop diagnostic tools in terms of uh, detection of, of this pathogen in seed training of farmers, training of other stakeholders, like the national breeding programs in East Africa, in terms of management practices, identification of the disease. And um, we, uh, have Unit helped to establish uh, an MLN pest-free area in Kiboko, where the seed can be grown and, and um, if found to be free, can be used in the breeding program within the country and maybe in Tanzania or Uganda where the disease has already been detected. But next, for, uh, next please. So for, but for other regions like Southern Africa where the disease has not been established, we worked with uh, Zimbabwe to establish uh, a quarantine site in Mazoe where seed that is supposed to be distributed internationally is grown. And only when it is free from the uh, MLN causal viruses is when it can be now distributed uh, internationally. And other than that, because we have our biggest breeding program in East Africa and um, we, the breeding program has to continue, 
Seed Health Unit also worked with the phytosanitary authorities in Kenya to establish a, a quarantine site in, in Naivasha in Kenya, which is, has very stringent guidelines in terms of inspection and testing and has resulted in very good results. And still the disease now seems to be, have been contained in, uh, in the region. So other than that, uh, the Seed Health Unit works with the uh, with national authorities in terms of uh, uh, establishing uh, like station management procedures. We also put in place, like we know the risks that we face now, like we think at some time we might have an outbreak of uh, wheat blast. If it happens, we put in place a measures early so that if the disease happens, we already know what we can do with, to contain it. So, so who are the people behind uh, these uh, phytosanitary measures at CIMIT? So for a long time, um, Monica Msalama, ab ab about 20 years, she put in place all these, uh, most of all uh, these requirements. And now we have this team, very experienced uh, in, uh, in, at the headquarters. And we have Tanya in, uh, Zimbabwe, and we have also a satellite lab in Nairobi to, to test for MLN, MLN causal viruses. And automation, we have Kate Thresher, who helps us, who is helping us to develop our automation system to link up to the data management system at CIMIT. Next, please. I think it's the last. So, Other than that, we work very closely with Sakapa, Sanasika, and Sader in terms of inspection, getting permits to make sure these materials are moving, and uh, also making sure that uh, the phytosanitary measures we are putting in place are, uh, are in line with the expectation of the host countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amos. We're, uh, we're a few minutes uh, behind schedule due to the complications I think we had at the beginning and my needing to share your screen. So uh, I think we'll, we'll move on uh, at once and take the questions at the, at the end, uh, the discussion. Entonces, um, muchas gracias. Ahora voy a pedir a Maritza si puede tratar. So thank you very much. Now I'm going to ask Maritza if she can uh, share her screen. I hope it works. Te escucho muy bajo, Maritza. Eh, hola, ¿me escuchan? Sí. ¿Me escuchan mejor? Poco mejor, pero todavía está un poco bajo. Y la pantalla... You, we can hear you, but um, sí. um, sí, sí, sí. it's very low. Your microphone is very low. Can you see my screen? Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for participating in these seminars, for participating this week in all this event. I'd like to know if you can hear me well. Okay. Well, I can hear you well. Okay, yes, that's okay. Well, this presentation will show you how we make sure about the phytosanitary quality of um, collections uh, that are stored in uh, CS. I would like to emphasize uh, the cassava collection the phytosanitary condition of a cassava collection. Um, our, in, our special interest and the reason uh, uh, being of uh, uh, plant health or phytosanitary health, health is preventing uh, spreading um, disease through germplasm. Our um, collections are uh, wheat, uh, cassava, and uh, fodder uh, plants. Uh, I will make some comments about our collections of these seeds, and then we will focus in the phytosanitary quality of the cassava collection. Well, uh, the uh, germplasm um, health units at CS is responsible for evaluating the germplasm distributed, distributed by the genetic resources program and other CF programs, and that they are free from uh, phytosanitary diseases. We uh, evaluate uh, samples for the program of genetic resources and other programs, like, for example, wheat uh, 
um, fodder and cassava breeding programs. Our lab is uh, registered uh, before the SICA, which is the Colombian Agricultural Institute. This is a governmental entity that rules all the uh, export of material. Um, we work around, well, it's 12 people who work in our lab. Um, we all have different uh, professional profiles. There's an expert on fungi. There's a bacteriologist. Um, we have other person that is in charge of testing, molecular testing when evaluating cassava. And we have very efficient technical personnel who are our support personnel. Uh, among the functions of our lab, we have evaluation and monitoring of pathogens in regeneration fields. Uh, we are in charge of verifying the phytosanitary status of the germplasm distributed by the TRP program and other CAD programs, um, both nationally and internationally. Uh, the same goes for import process. We follow all the guidelines uh, of ICA and participate in um, assessments. We also carry out research to standardize and implement new diagnosis methodologies that are more efficient and sensitive. And we also, we're also in charge of phytosanitary um, standards. Um, um, likewise, we do research. Uh, we want to standardize and implement new methodologies that are more uh, efficient and sensitive each day. Um, I wanted to highlight among the most positive points in our um, uh, genetic research program is agronomic management and sanitary monitoring and regeneration fields. We work together with the area of regeneration and we do monitoring and if, uh, phytosanitary evaluations in different regeneration fields we have. This has favored us much. We think it is something very positive in uh, the management of our collection. Um, here, I'm showing you what we do concerning sanitary certification of bean and forage germ plasma. Evaluamos pues hongos, bacterias y virus mediante assess for viruses, bacteria and fungi through serology, uh, biology, biochemical and molecular procedures. We evaluate fungi through uh, taxonomic means uh, with uh, conventional PCR um, and uh, in virus, conventional PCR in ELISA. In bacteria, we use uh, conventional PCR, semi-selective culture media, and serological and pathogenicity tests. Uh, we evaluate around 6,000 accessions per year concerning seed uh, for beans and uh, tropical um, forages. Um, in 2020, we don't know. Uh, we'll see how we can do uh, after this pandemic. Our lab only stopped for one month, and then we continued our work because all the material coming from regeneration lots needs to be tested, and the conservation group has to store uh, that material in the long term once it's already assessed. That's why we made a great effort to evaluate every material that reached us. As for diagnostic methodologies for quarantine fungi in beans and forages, we use morphological identification through the taxonomic keys, uh, and we will compare. And now we are implementing confirmation tests for fungi that are uh, frequently detected. As for uh, bacteria, we use isolation and semi-selective media. We do confirmatory tests, uh, serological testing, and pathogenicity tests. We also do confirmatory tests uh, that are updated uh, to PCR for xanthomonas, pseudomonas, and cartobacterium. Uh, we have standardized our PCR methodology 
uh, for one of these uh, bacteria. And uh, the idea is that it will be used uh, routinely for this. We are seeking for more sensitivity and efficiency. As for methodologies for the diagnosis of viruses in beans and forages, we use serologic uh, ELISA tests, uh, and in some cases we use the uh, PCR methodology in non-routinary cases. Now we will focus on sanitary certification of cassava germplasm. There we evaluate uh, viruses of a quarantine type like virus X and yucca and the common multivirus for use uh, cassava. As uh, for the frogs in disease, uh, several have been, uh, pathogens have been related, these four viruses shown here, and uh, the phytoplasm of the group uh, SRII-16. All these are detected through conventional PCR, PCR, and isotherm uh, methodology, uh, methodology of yarn and ELISA in some cases. And this year we have migrated uh, what we did with ELISA for virus X to molecular testing. Well, just to show you how we evaluate around 5,000 uh, cassava samples evaluated per year. Um, each day, all the collection should be available from a phytosanitary point of view. And we do necessary testing for cleaning processes and to recheck uh, sanitary quality. Sanitary certification of viruses and cassava is first of all done <clears throat> by receiving the plant material from in vitro conservation. This is another area in our program. They send us in vitro plants with leaf tissue. They are uh, marked with their QR code. Then we extract uh, nucleic acid. We measure uh, its concentration. Then we do cDNA. And then we verify that through uh, special um, PCRs. Sanitary certification of viruses and cassava by conventional PCR is done uh, for the virus X of the cassava for uh, uh, virus that is uh, all the viruses shown here, and they are all associated to uh, the uh, frog skin disease. Uh, uh, through the PCR methodology, we detect these viruses related to uh, frog skin disease, uh, which are uh, uh, poliovirus and uh, real virus, uh, and uh, results are shown as graphs and what we uh, see in improving these methodologies to have them more efficient and sensitive um, every day. How we evaluate uh, the 16 SRS3, we receive the plant material, we do uh, nucleic acid extraction, we measure their concentration, its concentration to see what uh, quantity we need for the necessary testing, and then we do the final description by, by the LAMP methodology, uh, which is an isothermal methodology that has been standardized through this um, device, which is called the rotor gene Q. Before reaching this LAMP methodology, we used to do qPCR in LAMP and we evaluated many samples. And finally, we decided to stay with LAMP because it is much more sensitive and efficient. These graphs are showing how through all of the history of this frog skin disease, our uh, methodologies have changed according to reports and articles published by scientists. Uh, there are many scientists who study this disease, who have worked and have uh, contributed 
very much seeking for causing agents for more than 40 years. Uh, therefore, we have changed our methodologies a long time. The first report was by Pineda and uh, et Alia in 1971. Um, in the 80s, all the sanitary evaluations for this disease were done through grafting tests as a diagnostic. Uh, and then uh, in 1989, we started to develop a different methodology, which is DSRMA with uh, its double strands. Um, and in 2006, we evaluated for real virus. due to the fact that we had uh, literature reports that found a real virus uh, related to this disease. Later on, all the Quetzalba collection in 2009 uh, had uh, been evaluated at 99% for um, quarantine pathogens pathogens, but they had been evaluated by GRAF and by RT-PCR uh, for uh, CSFSAB. So in 2010, we had reports about phytoplasm related to this disease. In 2014, there was deep sequencing work uh, uh, done by Carvajal et al. Uh, and they published a paper in which I also participated, where we found other viruses, as we see here, associated to this disease. And we started with evaluations and implemented necessary methodologies to be able to evaluate and certify that our exceptions were free from these viruses as well. So we restarted to evaluate the entire collection. Then in 2016, there was there were new phytoplasma reports uh, in Paraguay. Um, this was a, a PhD thesis, and uh, there was a th PhD thesis in Colombia too. Um, and from that, we decided in the program to suspend all the distribution of cassava germ plasm, and we started to evaluate again uh, for uh, phytoplasma. So we started from scratch. This was very um, exacting work, and uh, we are at an availability of 87% because we are evaluating everything for phytoplasma. A long time, we have uh, fine tuned our methodology from uh, conventional PCR per, to qPCR because we're looking more and more sensitive uh, for more and more sensitive methodology. Well, to summarize right now, uh, in our collections, 6,155 accessions, um, we have 87% available. They have been evaluated uh, from the health point of view, view and they are free from all pathogens uh, I mentioned before. This is a great achievement because we started from scratch and we had to start evaluating the entire collection um, as from the new pathogens uh, found for this disease. Um, research uh, with this disease continues. There are several groups, mainly the group of Dr. Wilmer Cuellar uh, from virology. They are doing research to clarify uh, the etiology of this disease. Etiology. Uh, since we have uh, almost completed the in vitro uh, evaluation, and now we are doing cleaning processes and verification processes to see if we have been able to eliminate these viruses, we continue with our work. At the same time this year, we started with a sanitary evaluation of the Cassava bonsai collection in CS. Additionally to this uh, in vitro collection, we have a bonsai collection. These are small plants that are uh, planted. As you see, we have four um, um, greenhouses 
and uh, um, um, facilities as uh, the one you see, and we're evaluating this collection from its health point of view. We have collected 196 accessions, and we have evaluated 246, and the results have been presented, as you see in this uh, bar graph. Nino and Gonzalez are doing this uh, study. Uh, we see how samples are taken from the uh, greenhouse to take uh, them to the lab and uh, evaluate them for all the pathogens I mentioned before. Just to show you that along the years, we have changed our methodology. We no longer use ELISA for uh, a common mosaic. We use PCR. And from RT-PCR, we have gone to PC QPCR, and we have implemented and standardized the evaluation of phytoplasma through LAMP. Uh, this has been through uh, collaboration with uh, colleagues who work uh, in virology uh, to characterize uh, these pathogens, also for, with CGIR colleagues. We want to continue progressing and implementing work, continue working so that our uh, tests are more sensitive and efficient. This is why we have the idea of implementing uh, um, Diagnostic methodologies for the sanitary evaluation of cassava, like, for example, implementation of a multiplex real time PCR, and also for the cassava common mosaic and virus A. We have received a, a training with Sanity Diversity uh, Lab. We have worked uh, a lot to start implementing to uh, implement deep sequencing to have confirmation testing and for detecting new pathogens. I didn't want to finish my talk without telling you that our lab is working very well. We have separate areas and we have planned a quality management system. We are very glad to share with you that SIAD is building a new building, the future gene bank new building. We will have the germ plasma uh, health uh, lab there. It will be larger, more modern. We have 134 meters now, and it will be 450 meters um, when built. It is, um, it is being built with all of the regulations. It is quite advanced, and we hope that at the end of, the, of next year, we will have our new lab. And thank you very much. Excuse me. Thank you very much for listening to these uh, to this talk, and thank you to the GHU CAT team. We are a great team, great people. Thank you very much to you all. Thank you very much, Maritza. You were in time. We're still a bit a bit behind because of the. Um, time uh, we spent at the beginning. Thank you very much for this great presentation of the work you do. Uh, we will have uh, questions at the end, but perhaps your presentations. Well, you can start um, thinking about this question. What is the biggest challenge or the most important challenge you have in this uh, phytosanitary work right now? La próxima presentación de doctora Giovanna Mueller. The next presentation is by Giovanna Mueller from the Health and Quarantine Unit of TIP. She will be talking about the uh, role of safety in um, spreading uh, international diseases in the world. Giovanna, you have the floor. We can't listen to you, sorry. We can't hear you, Giovanna. Okay, disculpe, sí, no podía ver mi screen. Excuse me, I couldn't see my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Perfecto. 
Very well. Good morning to you all. Thank you very much for your participation today. Uh, be welcome to this uh, series of seminars we are presenting within the framework of the uh, Phytosanitary Awareness Week. Uh, the SIPS Health and Quarantine Unit was created in the 80s in uh, the recognition of the importance of the role our institution has. And uh, today I want to present our role uh, so you can understand what is the work we do and the, the great responsibility we have in preventing uh, transboundary pest um, in germplasm uh, distribution. Our um, quarantine uh, unit, HQU, uh, is aligned with national and international standards and with regulations on uh, plant protection at local level and at international level, also regional level, of course. So you can see here the different instances that regulate. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. As I was telling you, we are aligned with the different international and national and regional standards following current regu local regulations that are issued uh, by SEDESA and internationally too, because SIP is an international center and we custody germplasm, which is internationally and locally distributed. And we also uh, acquire germplasm from other institutions and localities. We also follow the, the international technical guides of ECHO and uh, FAO, EPO and FAO, to be updated uh, concerning validated diagnostic methodologies that are accepted internationally so that our materials can be received in different uh, destinations with no problem whatsoever. And so that they can be recognized by different institutions that regulate phytosanitary aspects. The principal role of the unit of sanidad and quarantine of CIPSD um, HU is to reinforce the plant health policy uh, within SIP through surveillance and monitoring of plant health, uh, controlling harmful uh, organisms, and also uh, performing risk analysis to develop measures that will prevent or limit their spread. So we have an internal policy referring to procedures for conservation, acquisition, and distribution of genetic resources in germplasm that is custodied by SIP. Besides, we have a very important function, which is being a technical support for the national a health plant authority in the case of Peru, Senasa. We share information generated as a result of our research and our knowledge on endemic and exotic uh, uh, pathogens. We generate information that is relevant for their decision making and also for raising awareness about the possible uh, appearance of new diseases and looking for methods that will limit their spread and develop methods that will contribute to limiting that spread. Internally, we have different procedures and protocols, 
to uh, carry out uh, whether local movement or international distribution. Uh, we have an office in charge of the administrative part um, uh, concerning germ plasma. We uh, coordinate uh, um, with them the phytosanitary certification. Uh, we receive approval from Senasa and then we distribute the material. It is tested uh, through different methods, serological, molecular, and also at bioassay level. Uh, once uh, these materials have complied with our internal procedures and have been found uh, negative after having gone through a complete procedure of pathogen elimination by um, thermal therapy and other methodologies that, that certificate that they are clean and they have the HC2 uh, or, um, health plan uh, certification, then they can distribute be distributed safely. We guarantee this through a quality management system at SIP. SIP has uh, been accredited for the UK accreditation service for 12 years now. And we also have uh, ISO 17025. Uh, it allows us to make sure um, that we manage our data and that our personnel are competent and that the results Results, the quality results of our assays are insured or guaranteed. This allows us to have traceability so we can do safe follow-up of evaluated material in constant con communication with the germ plasm bank, the gene bank. And we thus support them in their decision making concerning managem management of germ plasm and then we ensure its distribution according to all phytosanitary requirements. I was mentioning the, the internal procedures we have, which are accredited by UCAS. Um, all of our material follow these procedures to be distributed. Uh, this is an index procedure. It has several stages and goes through different testing of different kinds, serological, molecular, and bioassay, as I've said, that are complementary tests. Uh, potato and uh, sweet potato germplasm follow this index process in different protocols according to requirements. In the case of sweet potato, we evaluate uh, uh, material for uh, all the different pathogens and viruses that are distributed in the sweet potato material. And this is an important requirement in phytosanitary um, permits or licenses. In the case of potato, nine viruses through serology and a virus and a viroid uh, transmitted by botanic seeds through a PCR test. We used to do that uh, with a molecular test that was hybridation, but now we have recommended PCR for these two pathogens. And the idea is to continue developing diagnostic methods that will allow for greater sensitivity so as to ensure distribution with the least number of escapes. Uh, we know that no test is 100% infallible. Therefore, there is always the possibility of escapes. However, through this system that articulates different complementary diagnostic uh, methods, we reduce to 0.001% the probability of infection in our material. Once we have evaluated uh, uh, material that can be positive to a virus uh, through our procedures in the germplasm uh, or the gene bank. Uh, we do uh, thermal therapy and uh, growing tissue, as I mentioned, to make sure that the material is cleaned and to be able to clean uh, them from the pathogen 
then it goes back to greenhouses to be evaluated again and verify um, this treatment effectiveness. As you can see this in bold, a long time so to be reached to uh, uh, this HS2 status. And sometimes this is a limiting factor in distributing germplasm. Um, the procedure is very safe. It has a high efficiency level. However, the limiting factor is time and the amount of material we have to uh, handle in uh, our greenhouses, as you can see at the bottom right. We evaluate around 500 accessions of potato and 400 accessions of sweet potato per year. That means 29,000. Uh, tests per year between lab tests and bioassay in greenhouses. And they have to have controlled conditions so as to make sure that uh, sweet potato and potato material can develop in optimum um, growing conditions. Therefore, this procedure takes time. And um, infrastructure with time this becomes costly too and we also look for ways of developing methodologies to reduce times and processes and at the same time um, keep or improve sensitivity despite covid challenges this year we have been able to manage tests as scheduled and these tests will guarantee distribution safe distribution of germplasm for further use whether in research or for repatriation or use in planting according to requests uh, from our uh, clients all over the world clients or users so these procedures we have at SEEP are accredited and have allowed us not only to grow in terms of personnel, we have been able to train our personnel developing their competencies, but also we have been able to have them work in different aspects of uh, plant health that we carry out in labs, in greenhouses, they are trained uh, for carrying out these tests and guaranteeing results so that they can be transferred to the gene bank and also for decision making, as I mentioned. This indexing and cleaning process for viruses can take between one year and a year and a half. As I mentioned, it's time consuming. And we're always searching for alternatives to shorten our time and improve sensitivity. In this regard, we have uh, inclined towards a new technology, a molecular method that is called um, sequencing small RNAs. It used to be called deep sequencing. In our case, it is to determine viruses. We work with SIRNA, and we understand that as part of plant defense, in case of viruses, there are enzymes that intervene to cut RNA small fragments uh, of virus sequences between 21 and 24 pairs of bases. And these little fragments will be found in great concentration in uh, the plant cells. Uh, and the idea here is to be able to purify these small RNAs and then through preparation of these sequences will then be join to markers that will allow us to identify them through sequencing uh, of high throughput 
then we will be able to do IT assays and we'll be able to identify them and assemble them again into uh, sequences that can be identified and then compare them with our um, databases. Um, and through these IT tests, we can identify sequences of viruses that we can recognize and that are present in these plants. This is a very sensitive technique and allows us to detect any pathogen present in a plant. The procedure is not complicated. It starts with extraction of RNA from uh, the leaves of the sample to analyze. We use it for extracting RNA. And then we cut and purify um, bands between 20 and 30 MT. And then we prepare the library. That is, we enrich these products and join them to a sequence that are like primers that will allow us to then identify them uh, through a run in an Illumina platform, which is the uh, high throughput uh, sequencing device we use. Then after the sequencing, what we receive is a large amount of what we call RIPs, which are small sequences uh, within the uh, range of nucleotides I mentioned that will be analyzed through a special software that will allow us to identify sequences uh, by aligning, aligning them with reference sequences in the gene bank database. At SIP, we develop together in an alliance with the Cornell University a software called Virus Detect. Initially, the format was in Linux that uh, we currently, we have currently developed a new software which is in the Windows operational system so as to facilitate its use. Um, this sequencing uh, method, high throughput sequencing method has shown high consistency. Uh, as you can see, we have different uh, ranges of production of these uh, reefs uh, for these uh, small RNA sequences that can vary between 50,000 and 2 million and a half reefs. And what we have uh, shown that despite the fact that we have a small amount of reefs, it is considered as a uh, little uh, amount. Uh, Although it's a high number of RIFs uh, in 2,500,000, we have been able to detect the viruses you can see in the bar diagram. There are uh, viruses like PVX and some virus too, and uh, there are other viruses that are more difficult to detect like PB, PVB and uh, uh, thymol viruses that were also detected, however, despite the fact that we had low concentration detection. Now, we, uh, at, at our research level, uh, what we are doing is validating this technique. This is the software I mentioned. Uh, we uh, just developed <coughs> on a Windows operational system to be able to facilitate its use. And as I mentioned, sequencing, high throughput sequencing, we're working with to detect viruses uh, by small, R by detecting small RNAs, um, we are validating at uh, potato, for potato and sweet potato. We have used uh, standard indexing uh, samples that we are running. And in this way, we can uh, really validate um, the, how, how robust this method is. Inicialmente obtuvimos algunas diferencias. In the case of potatoes, we initially obtained some differences concerning results um, in comparing both methods, the standard index method as compared to the um, 
uh, small RNA sequencing method. In this case, we had a divergence of results. Some were positive with one technique and negative in the other technique. But then when we adjusted for some parameters and repeated some samples that were coincidentally uh, found with a low quality, we were able to solve this issue and we found a 100 coincidence vis-a-vis both techniques. In the case of sweet potato, the result was similar and we hope we are able to solve this in the same way by repeating and improving the quality of extractions in, of our libraries. Giovanna, can you finish the presentation, please, because we are delayed. Yes, sir. Well, just to mention that SEEP also does training courses and capacity development at local and international level using different methodologies in which we work for a pathogen diagnose, diagnostic. This new methodology has also been uh, used for training. In the case of Peru, this uh, is being used to diagnose and characterize the diversity of the Peruvian potato virome by collections uh, in the field of samples in the field that then have been analyzed by the high throughput uh, uh, methodology that has allowed us to um, identify a large variety of viruses as the teratoviruses that are present and distributed in different regions of the country. Also, the rugose stunting disease of potato virus, uh, which is really a virus that appeared in the 90s and that through time disappeared. It was initially presented uh, with high incidence due to the vector transmitting it, which is epsilid. Epsilid at potato, uh, Rustoliana solanicle, then it disappeared. But in the samples made in this uh, project for the potato virome, we have uh, identified samples in the south of the country that contain teratoviruses that are similar to this pathogen that was identified in the 90s and which could not be characterized due to the fact that we did not have the methodology that would allow for that because it's a new pathogen. Finally, my conclusions are here. I should mention that the quarantine and health plan unit at SEEP is the main partner and ally of the gene bank or the, of the germplasm bank to guarantee uh, safe distribution of materials, both nationally and internationally, and for acquiring materials from different uh, places. Our role is very important to reinforce not only um, uh, distribution through diagnosis of materials, but also to train uh, personnel and make different areas awareness about the importance of plant health and complying with current regulations to make sure that we are distributing material that complies with every rigorous international and national standards for plant protection. The quarantine unit will always be seeking ways to provide the best results through the search and development of new diagnostic methods that will allow to improve time of for diagnostic, but also diagnostic sensitivity so that we can improve detection of uh, foreign pathogens, emerging or re-emerging pathogens, and make sure that our germplasm distribution is safe. The idea of having uh, the quality management uh, system in our unit helps us uh, in different centers 
get managed germplasm to harmonize quality standards, working and managing different processes and protocols so as to be able to work in alignment and also to work as a network that will support everybody to generate quality results, develop capacities, and internationally contribute to a better relationship with our institutions in charge of plant health surveillance. Thank you very much for your participation. I'm here for your question. Porque estamos, uh, Thank you very much, Giovanna. We, since we are delayed, we'll go directly to the next presentation. As you mentioned, we always work in close collaboration with domestic uh, uh, plant health institutions. So we have engineer Israel Espinosa from Senatica. He will be talking about the challenges they find in managing uh, plant health in Mexico, Israel. Um, do you have access to be able to share your screen? Is your microphone open? Estás por allá, Israel? Are you there, Israel? No te escuchamos, Israel. I can't, we can't hear you, Israel. If not, perhaps we can uh, have Jorge Andrade. Jorge, are you there? Jorge? Jorge. Okay. Um, please, to the, um, to the organizers, um, can you please give access to Jorge Andrade and also um, Israel Espinosa to, um, to be able to share their screen <coughs> as well as their microphone. Israel, Jorge, ¿tienen acceso ya o todavía? Mm, a ver, sí. See if I can do something. Parece que Israel no está conectado, no lo encuentro. Ah, ok, unmute. Jorge. Hello, ahora? John. Yes. Yeah. I am, okay. yeah, yeah. Sí, estoy, estoy listo. Ok. ¿Y, inicio entonces, hago mi presentación. Shall I start my presentation? Yeah, sure. I'll look for Israel now. Thank you. Colegas, eh, muy buenos días. Dear eh, colleagues, good morning. Compartir mi pantalla. Allow me to share my screen with you. Pueden ver mi pantalla? Me confirman? Can you see my screen? Sí. Please confirm okay. if you can Listo, see my excelente. screen. Okay, very well. Colegas, buenos días. Excellent. Soy Jorge Andrade. Good morning. I'm Jorge eh, Andrade. Eh, patólogo del Centro Internacional I'm de la Papa. I'm a pathologist from Y gracias a Jan Croes y a los organizadores de, de este evento Center. por haberme invitado. Thanks to Jan Croes and the organizers of this event for having invited me. Dos, I will talk about preventing patógenos emergentes, dos plagas emergentes que están uh, han sido reportadas en uno de los países sudamericanos, el zebra chip y el cilido de la papa. Entonces, cómo podemos eh, prevenir la diseminación de estas dos pestes. The idea is to prevent the dissemination of these two pests. 
Esta es el, la, mi presentación. Well, eh, presentación. Primero eh, la dividí en tres, eh, en tres fases. Primero voy a describir brevemente Zebra Chip, el, el cilio de la papa, y también una, una tercera enfermedad, que es el, uh, el punta morada de la papa, que también está causando problemas, pero no es tan importante realmente como Zebra eh, Chip y el, el cilio de la papa. Luego las acciones que estamos tomando a nivel sudamericano para prevenir la diseminación de estas plagas y las conclusiones. En el caso de eh, case Zebra Chip, el cílido de la papa y, y punta morada, eh, hablamos básicamente de cuatro patógenos que están involucrados y un insecto. Y en el caso de Zebra Chip, es, eh, es la bacteria Candidatus liberibacter solanaciarum, el es el apotipo A, que fue reportado por Jorge Caicedo en el año 2020 en el Ecuador. Es un reporte de hace pocos meses realmente. El segundo eh, eh, organismo que está involucrado en este, en este, en este tema es el Cine de la Papa, Bactericiera Cotterelli. Is eh, the fue reportado por Carmen Castillo. Cacarelli, mm. reported by Carmen Castillo. Ok, sí. Acabo de prender mi video también. I just, eh, uh, turned on my video. Entonces, Bactericera okay. Coquerelli, el cine yeah, de la so Papa, fue reportado por Carmen Castillo Cacarelli en el año 2019, también en el Ecuador. Y luego tenemos dos, eh, dos fitoplasmas que han sido reportados, el, el uno en el año 2015 y el otro en el año 2018, también por Jorge Caicedo y Carmen Castillo, ambos en el Ecuador. Candidatos fitoplasma aurentifolia y candidatos fitoplasma. Entonces, como ustedes pueden ver, hay por lo menos cuatro organismos que están involucrados en este, en este, en este problema. Zebra chip. Eh, candidatos liberibacter solanaciarum, el cirio de la papa bactericera coquerelli y al menos dos fitoplasmas. Eh, los síntomas, ustedes pueden ver aquí, eh, a, la, a la izquierda, arriba, ustedes pueden ver el síntoma típico de punta morada. Eh, aparece este encarrujamiento de los, de los folículos superiores, de esta coloración rojiza. Eh, las plantas... Eh, pierden uh, muchísimo rendimiento si es que la infección es, es temprana, si es que la infección um, es un poco más tardía, hay producción, pero los tubérculos son muy pequeños. Uh, en general, pérdidas muy altas. Eh, luego uh, tenemos eh, en, la, en el panel de, de abajo, uh, a la izquierda, síntomas de, de cebra chip, tanto en follaje como en tubérculos. Estas fotografías fueron proporcionadas, la primera de punta morada por Israel Navarrete, la segunda de, de cebra chip por Jorge Caicedo. Ustedes pueden ver estos, estas coloraciones amarillas, también rojizas, eh, en el caso de, de cebra chip en, el, en, los, en follaje. Y en, el, en los tubérculos, eh, cuando se los parte los tubérculos, ustedes pueden ver esta, este color marrón que aparece en la, en la parte interna del tubérculo. Eh, los cuales al momento de freír, sobre todo en hojuelas, adquieren una coloración intensa eh, marrón que hace totalmente... Eh, eh, no sirven los, los, los tubérculos para ser consumidos. De ahí su nombre, se uh, Y finalmente tenemos esta foto de Andrew Jensen, de el cilindro de la papa. Ustedes pueden ver aquí un adulto. En el caso de punta morada, el diagnóstico no es, no es, no tenemos certeza al 100% porque fitoplasmas en general son muy difíciles de diagnosticar. En el caso de bactericera uh, de, 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 perdón, de candidato libaribacto solanaciaro, el diagnóstico es más certero y tenemos la, la certeza de que realmente tenemos este patógeno en el Ecuador al, al, y de igual manera bactericera eh, Esta es la línea de tiempo, cómo, cómo sucedieron las cosas en el, en el Ecuador. Eh, el primer reporte de punta morada eh, ocurrió... Eh, antes del 2012, de hecho en 1986, hay un primer reporte de punta morada causado por fitoplasmas, pero no causó mayores problemas. Y luego eh, los reportes, eh, hubo un segundo reporte en el año 2012 y 2013, donde se reporta punta morada, el síntoma. Eh, y ustedes pueden ver ahí toda la línea de tiempo hasta el año 2021. Eh, en el 2014, por ejemplo, se hacen visitas a los, a los campos infectados, se toman muestras, se identifica en el año 2015, uh, eh, candidatos de plasma, eh, el, primer, uh, el primer brote de la enfermedad de punta morada ocurre entre el 2015 y el 2017. Uh, 
Outbreak, uh, was, uh, uh, the 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 in 2017, then we had the 2018 brote de la enfermedad. Uh, then the second outbreak eh, se hace of un uh, taller uh, para hacer un análisis de riesgo de plagas uh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, y otros eventos 20, 20, 20, más, eh, sobre todo por socios nacionales en el Ecuador para mitigar este problema. Events, uh, en el 2020, by, como les digo, uh, se identifica uh, candidatos a nivel de bacterias que solo nacieron y también en el 2020 se hace un taller internacional en Lima que ya les voy a contar. Entonces, como ustedes pueden ver, es una historia larga realmente. Eh, son casi nueve, eh, diez años eh, en donde el problema fue evolucionando hasta, hasta llegar a, a, lo que, a lo que tenemos ahora. Las pérdidas, eh, tenemos reportes de, de estimación de pérdidas de alrededor del 50% cuando las infecciones son tempranas, como les digo, eh, de Bolaños en el 2014. Y luego, eh, información un poco, un poco más, eh, digamos, circunstancial, tenemos... Eh, Pérdidas, eh, potenciales pérdidas en, el, en biodiversidad. Tenemos datos de que hay agricultores que están perdiendo sus variedades, sobre todo nativas. Eh, incremento en el costo de producción por el incremento en el uso de insecticidas, sobre todo. Al parecer, el número de aplicaciones que se está utilizando es eh, superior a 8, 10, hasta 14 aplicaciones. Y también una probable reducción en el área, en el área plantada de papas. Y otro reporte que tenemos eh, recién Recientemente es que los agricultores tratando de escapar sobre todo del vector de bactericera coquereli eh, están cultivando en las partes más altas de la, de la sierra ecuatoriana, estas zonas se denominan páramos. Es un, uh, es un ecosistema potato, muy frágil, uh, eh, pero es, está en zonas, en zonas altas, entonces está en zonas frías, está sobre los 3.500 metros. Eh, y por lo tanto, la, el ciclo de vida de bacteria coquerel se, se hace más lento, entonces es un poco más fácil de controlar el vector. Eh, sin embargo, eh, el, 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 al elaborar el suelo, se pierde la estructura y en, estas, en estos páramos es donde se colecta el agua, sobre todo para las ciudades. Quito, por ejemplo, depende de los páramos para, para su suministro de agua potable. Entonces, esto puede tener eh, potenciales eh, daños incluso al suministro de agua eh, de, las, de las ciudades. Y estos problemas han recibido mucha atención de la, de la prensa y de las y, y de, y realmente de todas las personas que están involucradas en el cultivo de papa. Ustedes pueden ver ahí varias, varias notas de prensa, varios eh, sitios web en donde se reportan los, eh, los daños y la preocupación que existe en el Ecuador. Articles por estos, reporting por estos problemas, uh, sí. damage and concern in Ecuador. Eh, um, el eh, agrocalidad, eh, junto con el CIP también, the, eh, well, sobre todo agro, la agrocalidad ha estado haciendo CIP, eh, vigilancia uh, epidemiológica de bactericeria coquerelli y de los síntomas de punta morada. Ustedes pueden ver aquí una, una pequeña base de datos, un mapa armado por Israel Navarrete, en donde ustedes pueden ver was, uh, myself, la, la distribución tanto de bactericeria a la a mano izquierda como la distribución del síntoma de punta morada a la derecha. Los, los reportes van principalmente desde la sierra norte, eh, frontera con, uh, con Colombia, la zona de, conocida como Carchi, hasta la zona sur, pero justamente a, 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 ayer, es, es una noticia muy reciente, ayer al parecer ya se ha reportado bactericera coquerelli en la provincia de Loja, que es fronteriza con, con Perú, entonces el problema parecer está, está eh, Israel Navarrete también es un estudiante de doctorado de la Universidad de Wageningen y él eh, estudió este tema en, en bastante detalle y identificó siete áreas y siete lecciones que eh, nos permitirían responder a, a epidemias de, de plantas, de de plantas eh, en, otras, en otras regiones. Ustedes pueden ver las, las áreas críticas, son siete, van desde colaboración y coordinación, comunicación y... ¿Sí? ¿Aló? ¿Me decían? No, adelante. Sí, ok. Comunicación y, y sensibilización, diseño y implementación de intervenciones, financiamiento, políticas de regulaciones, vigilancia e eh, investigación. Y hay toda una serie de lecciones que, que Israel con el grupo de trabajo de Ecuador ha podido sacar de, lo, de, de la epidemia que, que sucedió en Ecuador. Eh, por ejemplo, les pongo un ejemplo en el caso de colaboración y coordinación. Eh, se identificó que se necesita realmente un liderazgo eh, claramente definido para que para que hayan las coordinaciones del caso, 
con los socios claves que se necesitan eh, que intervengan en, estos, en estas situaciones y que la colaboración debe iniciar de manera eh, lo, lo antes posible para, para, venir, para prevenir la diseminación de estas enfermedades. En el caso de comunicación y sensibilización es necesario tener mensajes claros y a tiempo y, eh, y, y, y reuniones eh, regulares, periódicas para mantener a los, a los socios actualizados sobre lo que está eh, sucediendo. El diseño de, de intervenciones debe, debe realizarse utilizando información existente. Eh, esto es bien importante porque hay lecciones que, que, que se han tenido de otras epidemias similares, entonces es necesario tratar de, de utilizar la mayor cantidad de datos para diseñar las intervenciones. En el caso de financiamiento, por ejemplo, es necesario tener al menos tres tipos de financiamiento, un financiamiento de emergencia que permita responder rápido. Emergency funding, so as we quickly respond and then medium and long-term funding, particularly for... ...que sean realistas y flexibles eh, y que hay una coordinación a nivel internacional. Esto voy a hablar en más detalle más adelante. El caso de vigilancia eh, es clave realmente para contener la epidemia y eh, se recomienda tener, eh, eh, enfocarse en, eh, en ciertos eventos claves. Por ejemplo, hay ferias de distribución de semilla, hay mercados donde se, se intercambia material de siembra. Entonces, esos son los, los sitios y los momentos adecuados para hacer vigilancia. Y esta, esta, los datos que se obtienen de los procesos de vigilancia, idealmente deberían ser de acceso abierto para que puedan ser utilizados por otras informaciones o instituciones. Y en el tema de investigación, eh, tenemos eh, temas claves como la etiología, el diagnóstico y el manejo. ¿no? Entonces, en el caso de etiología, también, por ejemplo, en estas plagas es, es muy importante darle, darle eh, atención, ya les voy a mencionar. Entonces, las acciones que estamos eh, eh, siguiendo desde el Centro Internacional de la Paz. Following at CIP and partner institutions at South American level are the following. First of all, we had an international workshop in Lima in February this year. There we had specialists from South America, uh, Europe, and the United States, specialists in phytoplasma, um, candida, uh, candidata liberbacter, and potato psyllium uh, to discuss strategies and face this uh, problem. The main recommendation was to create a regional committee at South American level. We did this uh, along these months. We were able to put together six countries, 11 national organizations and five international organizations. They all make up this regional committee to face emerging pests. We have INTA from Argentina, Sena Saguinia from Bolivia, Saguinia from Chile, ICA and AgroSavia from Colombia, AgroCalidad de Nia from Ecuador, Sinasa and Dinia from Peru. Internationally, we have CIP, ICA, CAN, the um, Biodiversity CIET Alliance and Biodiversity Alliance and CIET and FAO. This is a very interesting group of institutions. We have uh, national investigate or in research institutes and uh, uh, plant health. Uh, plant and animal health uh, entities that are trying to contain these um, diseases. Uh, we are trying to have a participatory uh, platform. Here we um, upload all our documents, webinars, etc. We um, host them in this uh, participatory platform uh, that Enia has helped us build. Uh, another action we have had along these months is uh, six webinars that we have. Well, these are three webinars with six presentations each one. This was uh, organized by INEAP with cooperation uh, with support from IICA, INEAP from Ecuador. You can see the lecturers there uh, who are also specialists. Uh, from the United States and uh, Central America who talked about these three problems in quite um, in a lot of detail. In the case of INEA and SIP, we got uh, emergency funding to start research concerning the etiology of potato pur purple top. The pathogen is not so clear, particularly with INEA in Ecuador. We are developing three colonies of Bacteria coccorella Uh, we are studying 
the effect of Bacteria cochrali when it's not uh, infected with a bacterium. So the insect we are making uh, LSO transmission by grafting, LSO transmission by seed tubers, and we're doing pilot metagenomics. These are works that are just starting. Um, in the case of SIP, SIP is also working with a model called ILSIM. This model is allowing us to identify risk areas for establishment of bacteria Sera Cacarelli. Uh, on the left, we can see this is the establishment risk, risk index. And on the right, you have the generation index when we have values higher than 0 0.95 or equal to 6, respectively, the potential of permanent establishment of these uh, pests is quite high. This is helping Senasa in Peru to identify the areas where there should be um, stricter uh, epidemiological surveillance. Senasa is also working in manuals for detecting the potato psyllid and um, the zebra chip detection in the field. And with the Biodiversity uh, Alliance CF, uh, we are uh, making sure that all these data are handled with standardized protocols in uh, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia, and that they are uploaded in the past this place platform that allows us to share data and to have standardized uh, data allowing for meta analysis so as to compare with other similar plagues, I'm sorry, pests in the world. So it's a collaboration work here. My conclusions, we have three emergent pests, unfortunately, with a potential, a very high potential to cause significant losses to the potato industry in South America. These three problems have been detected in Ecuador, but there are very good lessons from Ecuador. Apparently, these problems are being managed already, and we have lessons uh, from the Ecuadorian case that are being applied with this regional committee that is already working on issues as awareness raising, surveillance, training, and research. <laughs> As you can see, despite the fact that we have this very serious problem, we have been able to react quickly to prevent the spread of this disease, of these diseases in the short term. Uh, it, they might disseminate uh, or spread to different countries in South America, but the idea is to delay that as much as possible. Thank you very much uh, to Israel Navarrete. A lot of information comes uh, from him. Connie Almekinders, Paul Strue, Carmen Castillo, Jorge Caicedo, uh, colleagues like Heidi Gamarra, Walmart Cuella, um, Jan uh, Kreuz, Erika Soto from Ica, Camilo Beltran from Cannes, and Senasa from Peru. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Uh, your comments and questions are welcome. Thank you very much, Jorge, for this great example of how different countries and institutions can get together and face a problem uh, that is a clear threat to the region. Uh, since uh, we are still delayed, we'll go to the next presentation. And if everything's okay, we can go on. Um, Debo está conectado a um, Israel. Debo poder... Así es, ¿me, me escuchan bien? Ah, sí, qué bueno. <ríe> ya tienes acceso. Excelente. <ríe> gracias, okay. Israel. <ríe> eh, entonces, eh, Israel es. Eh, Thank you, Israel. He is director of Senastica and will be talking eh, about the work they do to 
manage emerging pests, which are a threat for Mexico. You can see this. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, very well. Well, first of all, I'm very pleased to be here with you. Uh, congratulations for, for this kind of seminar you're promoting uh, this year um, of uh, plant health, a 2020 year for plant health. I'd like to talk about pests in Mexico generally. What do we do before a pest comes in or how we try to prevent or if such is the case, delay the production or reproduction of the pest. So as plant health, we are in charge of preventing pests from getting into our country. Therefore, I'd like to start by showing uh, what we protect as phytosanitary authority in Mexico. Mexico has around 24.6 million hectares for agriculture. Uh, we grow around 21.2 million hectares, and uh, that generates around 5.5 million um, jobs um, in the fields. They're extremely important for our country. And obviously, since we have a large extension, we have many uh, crops, and we are the 11th in the world in uh, global uh, production of um, um, crops. This is what we are trying to protect as an authority. Um, and how do we do this? Through a structure at Fenasica uh, that is divided in different general directorates. Uh, the general directorate for plant health in charge of establishing the phytosanitary regulation. We have the National Center for phytosanitary reference. Uh, they execute what, what we regulate, particularly for uh, imports. That's what they apply. And there are some other uh, general directors that are not uh, directed to uh, plant health, but they are substantial areas uh, that are focused in preventing pests in animals uh, and also diseases in animals and also uh, environmental uh, um, safety. Um, the general directorate of plant health is divided in four areas. The phytosanitary regulation directorate uh, is, uh, is, uh, that establishes the phytosanitary requirements for prevention of pests. And uh, to allow access for um, products according to these requirements. We have the National Center of Phytosanitary Reference in charge of uh, determining plant uh, uh, pest risk. Uh, they do surveillance and there is the fruit um, fly directorate and the phytosanitary protection directorate in charge of doing campaign for preventing dissemination uh, of uh, pests in, uh, that are already present in Mexico. What do we do concerning uh, phytosanitary regulation? Uh, we establish phytosanitary requirements for material to enter in Mexico, for products to enter in Mexico. Each product or a kind of product uh, um, enters the country following um, uh, pest risk testing. Uh, we try to determine possible phytosanitary risks related to this um, merchandise. And we do that through a uh, pest risk analysis, which is basically um, uh, prepared with technical information we request from the exporting country phytosanitary authority. They mentioned 
what is the situation of this product or merchandise. And there are a number of uh, specific uh, protocols that we use to uh, evaluate that material. We also complement that with technical information we have in databases, literature, and other fitted sanitary requirements that have been established in other countries. All that information gets together until we get the ARP, which is the pest risk analysis. Um, we try to determine the phytosanitary measures that are appropriate to prevent the um, uh, entry of uh, pests to our country and to certain regions. Um, uh, phytosanitary requirements of Mexico are public and they are available for the public uh, who can consult that before they bring their products to our country. I'd like to refer to a specific case, the CIMIT case. Um, we have several, uh, uh, several established phytosanitary requirements um, and we have produced them along several years. It is experimental material and it uh, um, requires risk evaluation. We have three, 232 combination keys uh, that are specific for a product, uh, type of product use, country of origin, um, or et cetera. We have 106 countries with a combination uh, key. Uh, for CIMIT, we permit imports from 106 countries and we have 13 involved species. The most prevalent one is wheat, as you can see, maize. We also have durum, uh, uh, also uh, rye, triticale, um, etc. This uh, has to do with phytosanitary requirements, the main uh, barrier to prevent the introduction of pests. We also have surveillance, phytosanitary surveillance. Uh, this is what we monitor as time goes to prevent pests. If for some reason during this inspection at the entry point it was not detected, phytosanitary surveillance can detect it. Uh, and also, you know, meteorological phenomena are also uh, the source of introduction of new pests. There is always uh, surveillance. Uh, we have traps, for example. We have strategies that are defined uh, uh, through which uh, Mexico um, controls very specific um, pests and also pests that can reach Mexico. Um, uh, surveillance uh, operates in the entire Republic. We encompass several farming areas. We identify areas that are particularly risky, commercial points, uh, supply centrals, uh, ports, airports, Also, uh, wastelands, there we have uh, uh, trapping routes to do follow-up to do to all this. And uh, we have active surveillance and uh, passive surveillance. In active surveillance, we have established some parameters as uh, trapping routes, sentinel uh, plots, uh, surveillance routes, exploration areas, trap um, a greenhouse, sentinel plant, and as we uh, uh, check um, crops, we check also for other pests in this kind of uh, surveillance. We get reports from producers, researchers who um, pass us their alerts if the surveillance system has not detected them. Um, something we also said at the beginning, uh, was that we apply uh, domestic regulations. We have 25 national regulations concerning pests, like uh, external quarantine. Um, we also do activities for official control of pests in Mexico, as we do for uh, wheat, 
as I mentioned also, there are areas that have been declared as free, others that still have the pests. So we try to prevent those pests from expanding or spreading in the country or beyond. Uh, we also regulate uh, mobilization of specific products and installations related to uh, plant products. We are, uh, we have diagnostic uh, labs that are accredited uh, before our authorities. They are official uh, labs and we have seven, 16 uh, approved labs. How do we take care of all this? As you can see in this map, Mexico has around 58 uh, inspection points where we allow um, the entry of uh, merchandise. They are divided in three regions so as to say in borders, airports and ports. We have 596 um, operational um, helpers in 84, uh, 301 inspectors. Um, this is how we regulate uh, phytosanitary inspection. We operate phytosanitary inspection. This is a very specific case, an example of how we have been working with a uh, capra weevil, uh, a pest that is important for Mexico and for all the American continent. It's, it's absent in Mexico. However, in the last years, we have been under the impression of finding this pest in different uh, shipments uh, that are not necessarily um, agricultural or farming um, imports. So we have increased surveillance. Therefore, in this map, you can see how uh, surveillance is being applied in different risk areas in uh, collection uh, uh, points or entry points. Um, and we prevent this pest from uh, entering the country in this way. Fortunately, we have not detected it yet. And we have intercepted the pest in ports. Uh, something very quick here about uh, action mechanism. When this uh, pest, uh, um, is detected, we uh, immediately return their merchandise. We tell the country of origin, um, notify the country of origin, and we uh, send an alert for OIFA and NAPO. Uh, Mexico tells all of them about the fact that uh, the pest was detected in a certain uh, container, and therefore they are told so this pest uh, cannot uh, be or should not be uh, entered in any other country. And we also detect uh, the pest through a very careful uh, inspection in the ships. And then we suspend the phytosanitary requirements at farm. Um, we, uh, this is a way in which we have stopped pests for several kinds of products in seeds. A, a big challenge here, again, we have the action mechanism. We re-inspect at 100%. <clears throat> and uh, it's very exacting because these are grains and we have to take samples. If um, the result is negative, then they can enter their merchandise. But if it's positive, they have to go back to their country of origin. And among the mechanisms Mexico has, we are trying to raise awareness on clean containers. Uh, you know, uh, trade through containers has significantly increased 
uh, Mexico has become more globalized. There are more entry points, more countries who want to enter product, their products in Mexico. So in that regard, we have identified containers as a source of contamination. Uh, so we monitor uh, logistic yards and ports to have control. Uh, and we have traps uh, there. Yeah, as I told you, Mexico promotes container measures. Uh, in sanitary, phytosanitary inspection of maritime containers. And we have uh, ads where we invite all users of these, uh, of this kind of containers to, to clean, to clean everything because we don't want that risk. Uh, to a great extent, this is what Senesica does concerning the application of phytosanitary measures. And if, if there are specific uh, pests emerging, we apply specific protocols depending on the pest and also uh, domestic uh, emergency um, devices. Uh, I didn't want to go on. It's part of my presentation. I'm here for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Israel, for your presentation, a very clear presentation. We are a bit delayed and we have reached our webinar time. I would like to go on for about 10 minutes if uh, lectures are available to do so, so we can have some debate about the issues we have found in different presentations. Jorge left, so he can't be with us, but if others are ready, please let me know. No problem, Jan. Okay. Very good. Um, well, in the presentations uh, I saw, from the presentations, uh, I have seen several questions. Like, for example, mine, which is what is the biggest challenge you face at this time um, related to COVID-19 or generally speaking to or uh, to your phytosanitary uh, work. Uh, perhaps one by one, uh, you can answer one by one. Perhaps we can start with Amos. Amos, are you still there? Yeah, so I was asking the question, um, what, is the, uh, what is the most important um, um, problem or constraint that you're currently facing related to um, the, the phytosanitary work that you're doing. And that can be a general problem or it could be related to the COVID-19 situation that's that's currently ongoing. Uh, I'm trying to get feedback from different uh, presenters. Okay, so um, the, the main challenge now is that uh, currently we have uh, a limitation on the number of people who should work, uh, uh, both by the Mexican authorities and uh, by also CIMIC. So we have to maintain a uh, 30% uh, workload. So that reduces the number of people we can use during this peak time. And um, we also cannot hire new people because the, it has been stopped. So. So that can be a problem, but we are navigating it and having people work on different shifts. And uh, so basically, we, we are not, COVID has affected our operations by about 80%, but we are navigating that. So it's, 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 it hasn't caused any critical problems, is, is what you're, what you're uh, saying? Sure. sure, we still operate full time. Yes, uh, I, su I suspect that will be the same with other participants. Um, Eh, quizás Maritza, que es 
¿Estás todavía? Maritza, perhaps, are you still there? Maritza, are you still there? Sí, 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 aquí estoy. Yes, yes, I'm here. <laughs> no había escuchado. Okay. I, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Well, yes, one of the challenges with the current situation we have is being able to carry out all the tests and send results in time. And CIAT, uh, well, CIAT is not open for all of the personnel. In April, we started at the beginning three people, then four people. Now we are seven people working per day. We take uh, sometimes we can't uh, be all together. So the idea is that it's a challenge to be able to fulfill uh, all of our objectives and uh, in our uh, genetic resources and uh, breeding programs. But we have been able to improve thanks to management and thanks to the occupational uh, health uh, in CIET that has allowed us to work with all the uh, biosafety procedures that are necessary. Thank you very much. I think that uh, you, this shows the importance of our work. It's good to know that we have been able to manage the situation despite the problem. Joana, would you like to add something to this? Yes, additionally to um, the restriction to um, personnel uh, attendance at SEEP, we also have this problem in our um, sister centers also, the fact that we developed a biosafety uh, protocol before we return to our critical activities in uh, SEEP, well, this allowed us to uh, do all tests in diagnostic uh, with our personnel following protocols without any problem. However, uh, besides restrictions with personnel, the issue is coordinating with other areas. We have to coordinate uh, um, delivery of uh, materials with the gene bank personnel. So we have to coordinate uh, dates and times. Another limiting factor is working with our suppliers of uh, consumables and reagents. You, uh, well, we work a lot with imports of uh, consumables and reagents. Therefore, that has been a challenge, being able to organize and coordinate this so that they reach us in time and we can do testing. Also, the issue of coordinating work in um, greenhouses because there's a lot of material and only half of our personnel went. So we had to plan that well. But this has been a great opportunity actually to be able to develop creative measures and uh, um, to have things uh, done in time. We have found room for improvement and made our work more efficient. Besides, we've also grown in terms of internal organization and uh, monitoring our quality system. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the import part is also relevant. I guess the other centers have also suffered uh, with this. What about Senasica? How has this affected you? Yes, in fact, personnel reduction has uh, affected us to a great extent extent in the application of some phytosanitary measures. Concerning imports, we got delayed at the beginning of the pandemic because the, the phytosanitary certifying documents, all the original documents, did not reach us because of logistic problems. Uh, so we looked 
for alternatives to prevent that kind of delay. In Mexico, uh, we have copies of phytosanitary certificates and they have to be delivered later. We have tried to do this in a more agile way through flexibilities, understanding that the situation is complicated and that imports can't stop, particularly for uh, food in Mexico. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, we have phytosanitary surveillance, and we have seen that some communities close access um, to them. So we can't uh, carry out these activities uh, like uh, for traps, for example, our personnel can't go there. That has also meant that we haven't been able to do all of our phytosanitary surveillance. Uh, pest increase, uh, we can say that perhaps in exporting countries, uh, their personnel has uh, reduced and therefore they are not inspecting their shipments. And this is why we have seen that pests have increased a bit. This is something we have tried to solve. And that's what we're doing now. Yes, they are important points. And do you think that there's more risk for pests to enter um, and that some pests get out of control? Or don't you see evidence of that? We don't see evidence of a, a pest that is present in Mexico uh, that has increased. But the surveillance system uh, in which we monitor every 14 days now we're doing that in three weeks or four weeks. So if something appears or reacting time is not as immediate as before. Yes, I understand. Another question that came up since we implement methodologies that are better and more sensitive and oftentimes molecular, but also more expensive, and we do that little by little, how can we manage this trade-off between cost and sensitivity? and um, assay quality. Is that a problem for you? Is that a problem for your work? Or you simply manage it? Or what's your opinion about this? Again, I'll start with Maritza. Okay, let's get started with Maritza. Yes, that's a big challenge. All the labs are seeking to have more sensitivity and uh, effectiveness or efficacy in our tests. You said it can be much more costly. It's true. In many cases, we don't have the necessary equipment or personnel or reagents that are more costly. But if we take a look at this objectively, if we get funds to get started, then it is better if we have a cost-benefit scale. The benefit will be better, will be quicker, will possess more samples, will have more sensitivity, will this uh, will rule out uh, false positives and false negatives. So. We'll ha we have to try to get the necessary resources. Once we do that, our progress is much higher. Uh, but you don't have this problem of being too expensive um, to do what we want because that's a, that's a problem. It's a very important uh, issue. 
But one other point I'd like to highlight is that back to the GIU uh, additional uh, budget, we've been able to do great progress with the educational weaknesses. Therefore, we have to become more strengthened every day and to continue in the fight to get these funds. Yeah. Okay, I totally agree with you. Amos. Have you been following the discussion in in English? Amos. Not really. So so the question, uh, the, the last the question I was I was posing was um, uh, how, we are using ever more better and more sensitive techniques, but often they are also more expensive, and so the costs may start escalating. and, and how do we how do we manage these um, the trade off between cost and quality? And is that a, is that is that representing a problem, or is it something that you are managing and and so masking views about this uh, this issue from from the panelists. Yes, so I think the more sensitive and mostly the molecular qPCR real time, um, it's um, these are trade off. And uh, what we do is that um, compost. Uh, first of all, the other routine tests can make confirmations of some of the pathogens, but where there is a doubt, we can uh, we can trade off by using say com compound samples, so that um, you don't just apply the stringent tests for everything that is maybe not suspicious. So that's a trade off for the. I think we must use those methods to provide confirmatory tests, but. Um, where the routine tests can confirm, we don't have to use them. But also where we need to be very stringent, we go with the compound samples. And when we detect, we have to use those methods to go to the this specific samples to identify which, which one is positive. So that's how we trade off the cost versus efficiency. Thank you. Yes, so, so what I'm hearing is that you, you normally do the the routine stuff, but then when there's cases of doubt or cases that are, that are maybe um, uh, of, of higher risk, you, you might go into these more expensive uh, molecular techniques to be able to, uh, uh, to be able to Can this. I also supplement, Jan? Of course. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this is a very important question and uh, we need to take, I agree with Amos, it needs to be in the context. Um, what is most important in, is sometimes high sensitivity doesn't mean that it gives additional information. It, the level of detection in a practical sense probably is same as what we detect with other available tests. So it, it is sensitive, but in a biological system, the virus titer is important. So if that virus titer is sufficient and then it is being detected by the existing tool, we could use uh, the uh, other existing tools. And also another problem with highly sensitive methods is uh, contamination. The more sensitive the technique becomes, the, the need for extra care to avoid contamination becomes extremely important. LAMP is a classic example. It is super sensitive. At the same time, it is highly prone for contamination. Totally agree. Um... Um, Giovanna, tienes, um, tienes um, opiniones? Giovanna, sobre... have you ha do you have opinions about this issue? Yes, Lara said exactly what I, I was going to say. It's very important to put this into context. The methodology to be used depending on your need to achieve a result. If there are many methodologies that can be used to define what we are seeing, if the seed is contaminated or not, uh, uh, well, lower, let us to say, uh, methodologies should be, should be sufficient. If we have to define incidence or intensity of infection or degree of infection of a material with a specific virus, perhaps we go to a much more sensitive methodology, uh, one that is more specific, that 
also, uh, uh, well, this uh, trade-off also reduces costs. We always try to improve and we will opt for technologies that will be not necessarily costly in themselves. We will have to train our staff. We need our personnel to be trained in that time and we have to validate methodologies. So costs are also increased because of these reasons, not because the test is costly only. We have to invest, and I emphasize invest in personnel so as to be able to uh, perform these tests and that these are validated. That's part of our quality assurance system. Uh, our methodologies should be robust and sensitive, but also they should be implemented by highly trained personnel and methodologies should have been validated beforehand. This might be costly, but in the case of seed, we have had problems with um, testing costs when they particularly depend on projects or activities that are not routine activities they are short-term implementation. Sometimes projects have not included these tests in their project, in their budget, and sometimes they are carried out as a result of supervision or um, others, uh, other monitoring we do to the material. Uh, we surveil our material in uh, our stations and outside our stations. And sometimes additional testing can be requested to rule out suspicious material. Uh, so these are the tests that are not in the budget and we need to identify which funds will cover these tests. Uh, but our routine users always distribute material and acquire material and they, they, they are able to uh, deal with this, these costs because they've already been budgeted. So thank you very much, Giovanna. Do you have any comments? Ray Salud? Yes, actually, I think that a lot has been said about this, but I'd like to comment that Budgets are always a limiting factor. Many labs, and Senasica is no exception, to this have this problem. But what we prioritize is most diagnostics of material uh, that is important, imported, and we try to get the quickest results uh, possible. If we need to use very specific uh, methodologies, we do so when we are at doubt. In other cases, it's routine diagnostics with less sensitive uh, testing, and we don't need to reach such a detailed level. So that's part of what Sinasika applies to. And as I commented at the beginning, we have certified labs, and we manage this in specific ways and they have a cost for each diagnostic and we are able to cover these expenses and we do so with public resources well thank you very much so i think that we will finish our debate with this this has been a very good debate presentations have been great very informative for all and uh, we have uh, just five minutes before they close us. I'd like to finish by thanking the lecturers. I'm going to make a summary of this session. And uh, on Friday, we will have another session in which we will discuss summaries from different sessions this week. So we can have a, a general debate of all the week. So thank you very much to you all. And 
I hope um, to see you on Friday. We have the Africa session tomorrow, by the way. Uh, it starts at 7 a.m. for us in Peru. And uh, you are welcome to participate. Thank you. See you later. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye to the English channel. Thank you, Maria, for your excellent translation. Thank you very much, Lava. I'm happy you said so. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye bye. And thank you for the IIDA team also for managing this. Yes, thank you, Lava. Nice to see thank you. Thank you, Yan. Bye bye. The recording has stopped. So please.